I've been wanting to do this video for a long time, but never really felt like I was quite ready. I've been using the SD Quattro since January of 2017 and now would like to give my views on it. This is to be in two parts. The first, this one, is about the exterior and why it exists and why it costs what it does. The second, we'll be looking at the kinds of results you can expect with different lenses and in different conditions, what it does well and what it doesn't, etc. This is going to be a long one, so please go grab a drink. In the years I've had the Quattro, I've had maybe one other person vaguely know what it is. Most think it is some kind of exotic medium format camera. They got the exotic part right, but the medium format part not so much. It uses an APS-C foveon sensor, giving the 1.5 times crop factor that most other APS-C sensors give. Unlike older foveon cameras, the Quattro uses different resolutions on each layer. Explanations of this have been done to death and on blogs and by Sigma themselves, so I'll link relevant technical data below. After thinking about it for a bit, I kind of do actually want to go over a couple of things as far as technical specifications go, uh, because it is a little confusing. So, as we know, the Foveon sensors, they have three layers, and the overall image size is determined by the resolution of the top layer of the sensor. The Quattro sensor's top layer has a 19.61 megapixel size, meaning the overall image will come out to 19.61 megapixels on your screen. That is 5424 by 3616. It's a 3x2 ratio. Each lower layer has 4.89 megapixels. That's 2704 by 1808. This gives you a total of 29.39 megapixels. But Sigma said it was 39, right? They said it was an equivalent to a 39 megapixel Bayer sensor camera. They're getting that just by doubling the output size and comparing the result to something like an A7R2, a D810, etc. Um, something else to note about the image output, the X3F format RAW files are 14-bit, and the DNGs are 12-bit. In my experience, this does make a real-world difference. Not much of one, but there is one. X3Fs usually look better than DNGs. Also, the DNGs are about twice the size of the X3F files. The maximum shutter speed here is 1 4,000th of a second, the flash syncs at 1 1 80th, and high speed sync is available and it's not very expensive if you go third party. Autofocus is handled through a combination of phase detect pixels and contrast detection. It is highly unreliable, and I treat this camera as a manual focus camera unless I'm birding with an extremely long lens, where I allow it to autofocus, throw it into manual, and then make the corrections. Uh, other than that, exposure modes are PASM with some custom settings, no green auto mode, which is nice. Everything else will be in the tech spec sheet. If you got any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Before actually looking at the camera in detail, I'd like to look at its lineage and history. Two things about the year 2002. First off, I was in 8th grade. Second, the SD9 came out, and I had no idea what that could have possibly been. The SD9 was Sigma's first DSLR, based on the film SA9. Pictured here is the SA9's cheaper brother, the SA7. They are physically very similar. He is wearing a period correct 50mm f2.8 macro EX. Good on him for the authenticity. After that, the SD10, SD14, SD15, SD1, and SD1 Merrill, which is identical to the SD1. The SD-1 story is particularly interesting and worth taking a moment for. When the SD-1 first came out, it was around uh, $10,000. Sigma cameras were typically very expensive, but this was pretty nuts. So the SD-1 was re-released a year later for about $2,300 as the SD-1 Merrill, and Sigma gave the original SD-1 buyers credit to go towards lenses and accessories equal to the price cut. So with the SD Quattro, Sigma took the complete opposite approach. Body only, on release, the camera was only $799 and could be had with the 30mm f1.4 art kit lens for about a grand, which, for what you're getting, is a crazy value. But just because it is cheap and insanely capable doesn't mean it's for everyone or really even most people. But we'll talk about that later on. For now, let's take a look at it in detail. Here in the front, after removing the cap, we can see the removable IR filter that protects the sensor. 
Usually, the IR filter is on the sensor itself, but not so much with Fovion cameras. This actually makes them great for IR photography as you don't need to irreparably modify the sensor. The filter is a little tricky to remove with just your fingers, but it's pretty easy with a pair of tweezers. On the front, you also see the lens release button and the power switch. While this is about as odd a place for a power switch as it gets, I've never had any issues with accidentally turning it off. It is big and obvious enough where I've always been pretty cognizant of it. Good job, Sigma. Um, here's the PC port for studio strobes. Given that this camera is most comfortable in a studio environment, it is great to see a still useful legacy port like this. As you can probably tell, the Quattro is covered in weather sealing port covers. Over here are the mini HDMI, USB 3, and remote ports. I can happily report, get it, report, uh, that focus peaking does show up when using HDMI, which makes it great for studio use. The USB 3 port allows full control of the camera on your computer, which further cements the Quattro's primary purpose as a studio camera. We'll explore this more in a later video. On the other side, we have the weather sealed SD card door. Unfortunately, there is only one SD card slot, and it is only SDXC. This camera could really have taken advantage of UHS 2 or 3 speeds, especially when shooting DNG, which yields files of over 100 megabytes. But hey, the slot feels really nice and the door's solid. Going to the top, we see the hot shoe and the usual controls. The wheels are very firm and clicky, which I like. The lock switch disables the face buttons while still allowing shutter speed and aperture to be changed, which is very useful since the face buttons are really easy to press, accidentally. Looking at the back face, you see all the usual buttons. The D-pad is made up of separate buttons. They're all fairly long travel, but they don't really have any real click to them. They just kind of bottom out, which is fine. They still have enough travel to where you know you've pressed one, but some people might get a bit turned off by that. Toggle switches, on the other hand, are very quick, clicky, and they feel great. Menus reflect everything else about this camera, designed to not get in the way. They are very to the point and easy to navigate, with three basic sections, photo, playback, and configuration, which I love. Sigma expects that if you're buying this particular camera, you probably know what you're doing, so they treat you like it. They also look nice and they're easy to read, very high contrast. Also, you may notice that there is no mention of video. Shooting usable video with a Foveon sensor would be a massive technical feat, and it would require tremendous processing power and cooling so the SD Quattro does not give the option. Leave a comment below if you'd like me to dig in more into the menus in the next video of the series, or if you could care less. On the bottom of the camera, there's a tight weather sealed door for the battery, a Sigma BP61, which is the same as a Panasonic BLF19. This makes the battery extremely common as the battery used in the GH3 and GH4 and is completely interchangeable. Also, you see a true marvel of engineering, the cover for the battery grip connector. It comes out all the way because there's a little spot on the battery grip itself to hold onto it so it doesn't get lost. Everything has a place. Marie Kondo would be proud. The battery grip screws onto the bottom and adds significant grabbable bulk to the camera, with a deep handhold that mimics the rest of the camera's grip. When all put together, you end up with a very satisfying confidence-inspiring assembly that is so comfortable to hold on to at both portrait and landscape orientations. At about $300, the grip is pretty expensive, but it's in line with other grips. But it's also pretty scarce. It's kind of hard to find. Giving it a firm flex, the grip does give a little from the body. I'm not that worried about it though, because there is a steel or magnesium pin that helps the tripod screw hold the grip on. The grip also has a tripod socket, which appears to have a reinforcing plate underneath, but I can't confirm this without a service manual. I am not undoing those screws to check, sorry. As you can see here, it also allows you to load up to two more batteries, as it does not connect inside the battery compartment as most other battery grips do. The SD Quattro uses all three batteries at once. With one, battery life frankly sucks and the camera faces overheating issues when the voltage drops to a certain point when the regulator starts struggling. With three batteries at once, you can shoot all day and not really worry about it. If you do drain them all, you can hot swap them with just the batteries and the grip. The camera splits the load between all three, or two if you're just using the ones in the grip and the one in the camera's dead, which can also give you a good idea of how good or bad your cheap third-party batteries are. 
Now that the camera is all put together, let's see how it looks with some of the lenses I have laying around. This is going to give you an idea of how Sigma's design languages evolved over the years, and I'll be able to remark a little on the user experience with all three of these. If you buy the SD Quattro kit, you get the 30mm f1.4 art kit lens. This lens gives you a 45mm full frame equivalent field of view, but being 30mm, it still renders like a wide angle. As I take a lot of photos of people, this is very much not advantageous to me, so I don't use it that much. As a walk around general purpose lens though, it's fantastic. It uses Sigma's global vision design language, making it a natural fit with the SD Quattro. Over here is the kit lens that comes with the SD-1, the 17-50 f2.8 EX OS HSM. This is a fantastic daily driver lens, although it isn't quite sharp enough to fully take advantage of the SD Quattro's sensor. Since it uses the older last generation design language, it looks a little out of place. Um, I'd recommend the 18-35 f1.8 over it, although the 17-50 is a great cheaper option. Here is an old, old lens from the 90s, the 50mm f2.8 macro EX. This is probably the most inexpensive SA mount prime you're going to find often, and it really shows its age. It's a first generation EX lens and looks very much out of place, and the optics don't hold up well against the Quattro sensor. From the mid 2000s, here is a lens that does hold up really well, the 180mm f3.5 EX macro. It was one of the first with HSM and is razor sharp. It uses the same design language as the 50mm shown previously before the EX branding and design update that I think came with the 50mm 1.4 of 2008, shown here. Great value choice for an SD Quattro or Quattro H owner for portraits or for macro. Here is the 50 to 100 f1.8 DC HSM art. When this lens came out, some reviewers were wondering why they would produce something so overkill for an APS-C sensor. That's because, along with the 18-35, it was designed first and foremost for the SD Quattro. To get the most out of the sensor, overkill optics are kinda needed. Design-wise, you can tell that they were made for each other, and this thing is absolutely brilliant. And kind of expensive, but great. Right here, this is the 80 to 400 millimeter EX, the first in the Bigma family of super zooms and the first to use OS. On the SD Quattro, the optics don't quite hold up, but it was great for its time as a more affordable birding lens. But wait, what is this monster? Yes, it's the 60 to 600 millimeter, the newest member of the Bigma family, and it is big. Too big for my little product stage. The Quattro pushes this lens to the limit, and it's a real challenge using it with the Quattro's limitations. But with patience and persistence, and a sturdy tripod, this combo can make for some very satisfying results. You'll definitely be seeing more of what this lens can do later on. I can't really conclude the video without putting some images taken with the camera at least, um, even though I was going to save the bulk of that for a later video, but I'll just show you a couple things that it could do. First off, here's a picture of one of my cats. Her name is Melon. Um, she's wearing one of her holiday sweaters that she loves to wear, or doesn't. Um, this image was taken with the 50 to 100, and it does a great job at showing off the Quattro sensor's insane micro contrast. Especially if we just uh, crop in her face here, you can see the detail in the fur, you can see the detail in the nose. Of course, focus was a little bit off because I was just relying on the autofocus and it's terrible. Um, but yeah, it gives you a really good sense of the sensor capabilities, especially with a, an exceptionally sharp lens like the 50 to 100. This next one is a portrait taken with the 17 to 50 EX, so the older zoom lens, the kit lens for the SD1, um, of a cosplayer at a convention back in 2017, I believe, in California. Um, it was a crowded, busy hallway, so basically I just popped the flash and then just blew out everything in the background just because it was just random people and ugly walls, etc. Um, but it, I think it turned out really nice, and again, that micro contrast really shows up in the eyes. Um, I actually managed to nail the focus in this one, which is nice. Uh, but yeah, this ended up being like one of my favorite cosplay portraits that I'd ever taken. 
This third one is of probably my favorite underappreciated bird, the American Coot. This was with the 60 to 600 um, f4.5 to 6.3 or the newest Bigma. And at 600 millimeters, this thing is really sharp. It's not prime sharp, but it's still sharp enough. This was handheld too. The OS in that lens is fantastic and really allows me to stay far enough away from the birds to where I'm not bothering them so they can go about their business. This coot in particular was foraging for food uh, while sitting in this really nice greenery. And also at 600 millimeters, even at f6.3, which I think this was at, you get some really nice background and foreground separation going on. I think this is my favorite bird image that I've taken. And here's where our in-depth look at the SD Quattro ends. Please throw any questions you may have into the comments and I'll either answer them in the next video in the series or in a follow-up video that will be specifically to answer your questions. If you like this kind of video, please treat the like button like a shutter button and press it. Subscribing also tells me that you want to see more, so it really encourages me to actually make more. The bell, that's up to you, but my posting is pretty sporadic for now, as you can probably tell. So hitting that might be helpful. Thanks for sticking through the whole thing, and in the words of one of my favorite not-camera-related YouTubers, have a good rest of your day.